All right, let's go ahead and get started with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, the, the opportunity to open thy word and to learn of thee. Pray that thou would be with us as we do. Pray that thou would open our eyes where we may behold wondrous things out of it. We ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we're, uh, we're in uh, the second of three uh, messages on Revelation 19. Uh, we're on our chart. We're down here, which is the bottom of the chart, and that's because it's the tribulation chart. It's only covering chapters 6 through 19. There's three more chapters if, after this. It goes through 22. We already saw um, the, um, the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb last week, um, and then we're going to see a little bit of Christ at least preparing to return in the first few verses of uh, this uh, section today. <clears throat> I want to I want to remind everybody of something we saw last week um, and make sure it's clear, uh, especially for anybody online that may have, have missed it or maybe you didn't get it last week. Um, we saw that Jesus Christ in verse um, verse seven has his bride. It says wife there, but it's the bride. And that's the bride of Jesus Christ. Um, but what we saw last week was, was that Jesus Christ has his bride, which is a chaste virgin, according to 2 Corinthians 11 and Ephesians chapter 5. But the Lord, uh, capital all caps in the Old Testament, is Jehovah. And we saw that Jehovah in that, in that situation represented God the Father, and he has his adulterous wife, which is Israel. So God the Father has uh, an adulterous wife, Israel. God the Son has his chaste virgin, which is uh, the, the church. So they're two different things. And some people mix those things up. Uh, I want to start by reading uh, chapter 19, verses uh, 11 through 16. Even though I got my Bible here, it's easier to read off of, my, off of the notes. So... We'll read, uh, uh, and it's, again, it's easier if you open your Bible because I'll be look, I'll looking at a few things that aren't on the, on the handout. So we'll read the whole thing first and do some commenting. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Pay attention to the capital letters there. That's a person. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. There's that capital W-O-R-D. Uh, and the armies which uh, were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it, he, with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Notice that's all caps, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So commenting briefly on the very first uh, clause there in verse 11, I saw heaven opened. We saw, and matter of fact, the next passage on your handout is Revelation 4.1. And it says, uh, after this I looked. Now, after this was the church age, which was represented in chapters 2 and 3. So this is the very first verse in the next chapter of chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Well, this is a door opening here as well. A door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. So that's the rapture. That's the church being taken out of the world, taken up to heaven, and they do not go through the tribulation. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And so what he shows him is things that are in the future. Now we come back to the, to the present at the very end of the book of Revelation, but most everything here is the future. I gave you 1 Thessalonians uh, 4.17 because it's also the rapture. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. There's the rapture. By the way, the word rapture is not found in the Bible, um, but caught up is, and it's, not, it's the same thing. Uh, the, uh, the shall, uh, then we which are alive and remain. Now, now the, the verse previous to that basically said the dead in Christ shall rise first. So if you have a loved one that's passed away that was saved, they're going to rise first, and their body is going to be put back together and changed on the way up. And then, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds. Our bodies will be changed as we go up. We'll get new bodies. Uh, 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 shall be uh, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now that's the rapture which occurs before the tribulation, at the end, which chapter 19 is, is when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, that's technically the second coming. And people guess sometimes get that mixed up. The rapture and the second coming are two different things separated by the tribulation. In uh, another part of that first verse, it said, Behold a, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. So somebody, the Faithful and True we're going to find out is, uh, is Christ, uh, somebody's going to be on a white horse. A reminder that back in Revelation 6-2, you don't have it in your handout, uh, we, uh, we identified another white horse rider as being associated with Satan, probably the Antichrist. I gave you 2 Kings 2 because, uh, and, 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 and also 6, which we're going to read next, because the horses there in the Old Testament are supernatural, like I believe the horses here in uh, Revelation 19 are, are going to be as well. Revelation 2, 11, uh, And it came to pass, as they, went st as they still went on, this is Elijah and Elisha, um, and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. That is not a natural horse. <laughs> and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So he would be the second person in the Bible, in the Old Testament, I should say, because um, technically Christ went up, but not the same way. He, he was resurrected. He, he, didn't, he wasn't taken up alive. Enoch was taken up before the uh, flood, and uh, Elijah here, he was taken up. Um, uh, Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, um, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. We're going to see another uh, uh, group of horses and horsemen um, in 2 Kings 6. And in this case, um, uh, the, I believe it's the Syrians are coming against Israel, and um, and they are being they are being about they're they're surrounded by uh, the, this this force, and um, and and his uh, Elisha's servant is afraid, and so in verse sixteen I'll read it for you. It's not on your handout. His, uh, his, uh, he says to his servant, "Fear not, for they that be with us are more than that, they that be with them." And then verse seventeen on your handout. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. I think those horses are, are of fire as well. So he, the, um, the servant couldn't see it, but they were there. Well, we've got, uh, I, I believe, angels looking out for us. We can't see them, but they're there. And then in, uh, the, at the end of uh, verse 11 in Revelation 19, he that sat upon him on the white horse was called faithful and true. And we'll look at that first, and then we'll get to the rest of it in a second. Uh, he was called faithful and true. Well, bottom, uh, the second, third passage from the bottom of your handout, page 1, there's a few passages there that talks about being faithful and true. Uh, Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These saith, things saith the Amen, and this is Christ, uh, the faithful and true witness. So Christ is the faithful and true witness. Well, he is here, too, in Revelation 19. He's faithful and true. The beginning of the creation of God. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 
uh, verse 24, uh, God speaking through Paul says, faith was, faith was he that calleth you who also will do it. So again, God is faithful. Christ is faithful. One more place on that, along that line. Um, we had this passage uh, last week, and I forgot who he was responding to. And I looked it up this time. It's, it's Thomas. Uh, so Lord Jesus Christ responds to Thomas. Uh, Jesus saith unto him, this is John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's one of the, the ways we can know that the only way to heaven is through uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. We get to the uh, very end of verse 11, Revelation 19, verse 11. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. So I got a couple passages on the second page of your handout that talked about him being a righteous judge in righteousness. So second page of your handout at the very top, we have 2 Timothy 4.8. It says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love us appearing. So if you love the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says right here, we're going to get a crown of righteousness. But who's going to give it to us? The Lord, the righteous judge. We don't have to worry about whether or not he's going to judge righteously because he is the righteous judge. He can't do anything but. Also, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, second page uh, of your handout, second passage down, John, uh, God speaking through John the Apostle, the same one that wrote Revelation, said, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And the picture there is, um, is you're standing before uh, the, the judge. You know, if, if we were to apply it to, to today and our day, we're standing before the judge and we have our lawyer looking out for us. He's our defense attorney, and he's also called an advocate. Jesus Christ, the righteous, is our advocate. So we don't have to worry about having an unjust uh, 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 way that that's going to end, because it's going to be just because Jesus Christ, uh, the righteous, is there with us. Um... Chapter, Revelation 19, 12, the very first uh, part of uh, verse 12, it says his, his, his eyes were of a flame of fire, uh, and on his head were many crowns. I'm going to talk about that flame of fire briefly. Um, in Revelation 1, 14, also the Lord Jesus Christ, um, uh, it's, as a matter of fact, verse 13 says, is one like unto the Son of Man, and we know that the Son of Man is Christ. Revelation 1.14 says, His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Well, that's, uh, what did we just read in Revelation 19.12? Uh, his eyes were as a flame of fire. It's the same person. <clears throat> On his head were many crowns. This is uh, Revelation 19, 12 again. On his head were many crowns. He will be king of kings uh, uh, and lord of lords, of course, and he's going to rule the king, all the kingdoms of the earth. We're going to look at that briefly uh, near the end, but uh, he will be the king of kings. Right now, uh, he's ruling in a way because we've got two kingdoms here. We've got the kingdom of uh, God, which is a spiritual kingdom, which we're a part of, it's spiritual. Then there's the kingdom of heaven, which is an earthly kingdom, which is he is not ruling over at this point. He's going to when he comes back at the end of the tribulation and rules for a thousand years. And then in, uh, also in uh, verse 12, uh, it says, And he had a name written that no man knew. Uh, oh, uh, and he had many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew, but he himself... There's many, if you read commentaries, uh, and, and, and you've got to be careful doing that because they can say just about anything. 
Although many offer suggestion on his, what his name might be, it says that no man knew. Therefore, no man knew it. Hey, so, so he has a name written and no man knew. Then later, in the next verse, we're going to say another part about his name. But that's the one he's made, uh, made plain to us. Um, and uh, verse 13, the first part of verse 13, Revelation 19:13. And he was clothed with a vesture, vesture. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. We'll stop there uh, uh, right now, and we'll come back to the verse thirteen. He's with clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. At his first coming, he shed his own blood for the sins of the world. We all know that. At his second coming, he will shed the blood of those that refused his offer of salvation, and oppose him alongside the Antichrist and the false prophet. There's going to a lot of, be a lot of people that are going to oppose him. Um, we see something uh, along that line um, in uh, verse 15. Ver verse 15, um, it says at the very end, uh, he and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And that's where that, uh, that, uh, that vesture dipped in blood is going to come into play. Now, you don't have it in your handout, but uh, in verse 21 of the same chapter, chapter 19, it said, uh, uh, The remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. We'll talk about that uh, uh, later, but that's how he's going to do it. He's going to do it with the sword that comes uh, uh, proceeds out of his mouth. Then we get to uh, middle of the second page of your handout, Isaiah chapter 63, and we're going to see another passage from the Old Testament that's talking about this very same uh, thing here in uh, Revelation 19. Uh, by the way, this is the, big, this is the end of the tribulation. Armageddon is about to start. We're going to get into Armageddon, Lord willing, next week. Um, Isaiah 63, uh, 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom? with dyed garments from Basra. This is, that is glorious in his apparel, per, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak righteousness, mighty to save. And then look at this. Wherefore art thou red in thy, thy, thine apparel? We're reading about that here in chapter 19. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Well, if you have garments on, and you're treading in the wine fat, that grape juice, that's what a, a wine fat is, is grape, you're, treading, you're, you're treading the grapes to make them into wine, and that grape juice is, jump, is being, uh, 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 getting onto your clothes. Uh, thy garments that tread, like him that treadeth in the wine fat, I have trodden the wine press alone, and of, thy people, of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. Why is that? Because he's mad about what's going on, what has gone on in the world, what has been going on in the tribulation, and all this uh, uh, again, going things going against him. And he knows that they're about to have a war against him. And in the verse 3 of Isaiah 63, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. So he's comparing somebody in a wine fat with the grape juice getting on their garments. He's comparing that with the blood being sprinkled on, on his garments uh, as he does it. And I will stain all my raiment. For the day of uh, vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. And I looked, there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury had hel upheld me. And then he says in verse 6, I will tread down the people in mine anger. This is uh, Isaiah 63, 6. I will tread down the people in my anger. So he keeps giving this uh, analogy of somebody in a wine fat with him treading the people down here in Revelation uh, chapter 19. Also, in uh, uh, next passage on your handout, Revelation 14, 20, we saw this earlier. And uh, let me, let me, before I read it, let me, let me show you where that was. Revelation 14 was here, and verse 20 is way out here. And I said that's, that, that, that passage is talking about Armageddon. So we're right back there again. And like I said, this chart shows you how the book of Revelation specifically 
um, chapter 6 through 19, which is the tribulation, is laid out, and it has multiple endings. And that's one of the, the endings. Revelation 14, 20 said, And the winepress was trodden without the city, exactly what we're reading here, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, so however high an horse bridle is, right? By the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs, and according to what I've read, a thousand and six hundred furlongs is somewhere between, because not everybody agrees on how long a furlong is, somewhere between 160 and 200 miles. That's a huge number. It's, and how wide it is, it doesn't tell us. But it's the, as, as, as deep as the horse bridles, and it's as long as 160 to 200 miles. Uh, it's going to be a lot of blood, a lot of blood. We get to uh, the end of verse 13, Revelation 19, 13, and it says, And his name is called the Word of God. His name is called the Word of God. Well, what I gave you in your handout is uh, the, pl the other places, John 1, 1, it has an asterisk beside it, John 14, 1, I'm sorry, John 1, 1, John 1, 14, uh, 1 John 1, 1, and 1 John 5, 7. This one makes the seventh. This is the seventh time that the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the Word with a capital W. Now, if you, if you look in your Bible, you'll find out that capital W for Word is never used outside of those seven times, and those seven times is always about the Lord Jesus Christ, just as it is here. His name is called the Word of God, and we know that it's talking about Christ. So one of my pet peeves is uh, songbooks and, uh, you know, uh, lyrics, song lyrics, and, and, and people who print things, and they call it the Word of God when it's talking about the book, which are words, versus the Word, who is the person. They're not the same. This is the Word's Word, <laughs> right? The Word is the person, and this is His Word, but they're not the same. Okay. Um... And you can look those up on your own. We get to verse 14. Verse 14, Revelation uh, chapter 19, verse 14. I want to compare that to verse 8. So I'm going to go back to verse 8 and read it, and then we'll look at verse 14. And again, this was uh, uh, the, the, the wife who hath made herself ready, and to her, which is the wife, which is the bride, which is the church, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. When we get to verse 14, it says something very similar. So that makes me think that we're part of the armies. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So since we're going to be in fine linen, white and clean, and these armies are in fine linen, white and clean, that makes me think we're at least part of the armies, uh, if not the armies themselves. There may be others. And uh, also, uh, we see something else, uh, second page of your handout, uh, just below that, those passages in, uh, uh, about the Word, uh, Jude 14 and 15, Jude 14 and 15, and Enoch also. Now, now not, nowhere in the Old Testament does it tell us that this happened, but here in the New Testament it does. Um, Jude 14 and 15, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, by the way, there's two Enochs in the Old Testament in, in, in Genesis, and this is the, the one that got the, taken up without dying. This, there was another one, though. Uh, Enoch also, the seventh of Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Well, I think we're, we're going to be, if you're saved, if you're born again, you've trusted Christ your Savior, the only reason you're going to heaven is what Jesus Christ did for you, and nothing you did, um, then you're going to be uh, one of the ten thousands of his saints. And wh what's he going to do? To execute judgment upon all and to convince all. Now look at this use of the word ungodly. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed <laughs> and, all of, and, of, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I'd say Jude's pretty, uh, God speaking through Jude is pretty firm that there's some ungodly folks out there and we're going to find them in this book, especially in the uh, book of Revelation 
because uh, that's uh, where it's talking about here. The Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Ten thousands of his saints. Uh, verse 15, Revelation 19, 15. We, all looked, we already looked at the very end, so uh, let's look at the first part of 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it, with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Okay, so with the sharp sword that proceedeth, uh, that goeth out of his uh, uh, mouth, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, um, that he's going to smite the nations with that. So i got a couple passages about what proceeds out of his mouth and what is the Word of God. Ephesians 6.17, near the bottom of your second page, your handout. And uh, that portion of chapter 6 is talking about the armor of God, and this is the last thing it mentions. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Notice the capital S there. Uh, that's the Holy Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So this book right here that we call the Word of God is, uh, is the sword of the Spirit. And in that context, in, effect, in Ephesians chapter 6, it's the only offensive weapon there. there. All the rest of them are defensive uh, uh, in nature. Also... In 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, and the context there when we read this before is the Antichrist. And it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, And then shall that wicked, that was the, the Antichrist, that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, the spirit of his mouth that's coming out of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's going to come, in, come into play here in chapter 19. Of Revelation. One more place about the Word of God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, sec, uh, bottom of the second page of your handout. For the Word of God is quick, and that word quick means alive. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divining asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That book can discern between the thoughts and intents of your heart. And so we, we have to recognize that it has that power and, uh, and let it do what it's supposed to do. In um, verse 15 also, another verse along that line is Isaiah. So we're at the third page of your handout at the top. Um, going along with that what we just read, what the Word of God is. Isaiah 11, 4, But with righteousness he does judge the poor. We saw that God always judges in righteousness. And reprove the equity of the meek, uh, for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. That's an interesting phrase. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Well, what's that breath of, the, uh, uh, of his lips all about? Well, that's how we say words. So the word, the capital W-R-D, is going to, through the breath of his, uh, uh, of his lips, using words, he's going to slay the wicked, and that's going to happen over here in uh, chapter 19. <clears throat> I gave you in your handout, uh, with an asterisk there, um, how powerful God's spoken word is. Yes, yes, he's the word, the capital W-R-D, and he also has written word, but he also has spoken word. And here is things that he spoke. And in each of those verses, Genesis 1, 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 20, 24, 26, each of those verses said, and God said. And after he said something, something happened. And there's a, so that shows power, extreme power, as a matter of fact. Um, John 18, 6, the context there is Judas has, dis, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He's, he's given up the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the right word, but he's, he's, he's betrayed him. He's betrayed him, and now they've come to take him, and he's told them, let these go. Let those, these the ones that are with me go. And then, so that's the context. And, and, and so that we, we get to the verse, uh, John 18, 6. 
And who, as soon as he had said that, uh, had, as he had said unto them, I am he, because that's what he said, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. All he did was said, I am he, and they, he, they, they knocked him to the ground by just saying those words. Well, since his request just before that was, leave my disciples alone, my guess is that's one of the reasons they left him alone, right? At least for that, at least for that, for that point. They fell to the ground just because he said, I am, I, I am he. Uh, he's going to uh, rule them with a rod of iron. Um, and so this is, uh, this is not that gentle Jesus that they want to show in movies, uh, meek and mild. Um, uh, he was that for the most part, but, but to those that uh, were against him, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the chief priests, he was against them. For those that uh, would receive him, he was, he was, he was gentle. He was uh, uh, exactly what they depict, but not to everybody. Uh, he, he said to the Pharisees one time, woe unto you, woe unto you, woe unto you, you know? And uh, uh, the woe was uh, uh, very bad. Um, and I flipped, I missed my page. Um, uh, again, we're at verse 16, Revelation uh, 19, 16. And he hath on his vesture, on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I gave you a couple more passages. At, uh, third page of your handout. Another one with an asterisk. And in both of those two passages, and, and it's, talking about, it's talking about Satan coming among the sons of God, and, uh, and Satan is going to be allowed to persecute Job, and God is going to allow him to do it. But, but the, the point I'm trying to make is it's the sons of God, we're sons of God, are going to present themselves before the Lord. So I believe that those sons of God, just like we will be sons, we are sons of God, we will get, be given um, authority in the, in the tribu not tribulation, the, uh, the, the thousand year reign, to reign over something because of what we've, we've been doing here on earth. I'm pretty sure of that because Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, last pa uh, uh, passage on your third page of your handout, um, we're told, and hath made us, meaning the, the church age believers, hath made us kings and priests unto God, unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we are going to be kings and priests at some time in the future, and so when he's king of kings and lord of lords, we're going to be one of the kings. Praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee again for the opportunity to open thy word and to consider what we've seen out of it. Pray that thou would uh, cause us to meditate on it, that thou would use it to draw us closer to thee. Uh, give us an opportunity to be a witness of thee. We ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.